The fourth generation Ford Focus puts its maker right back into contention in the family hatchback segment, with smarter looks, much improved interior quality and extra technology. There's also greater efficiency beneath the bonnet from a completely rejuvenated range of engines and what Ford claims to be class-leading levels of safety. The best part though is that this car still remains as rewarding to drive as it's always been. The Focus might have grown up, but it certainly hasn't lost its spark. It's very difficult to overstate the importance of the Focus family hatch to Ford's European business. On sale now for over two decades with 16 million global sales, uh, for our part of the world it's proved to be the company's most important market offering since the Model T. Here's the fourth generation version, a design the Blue Oval brand is very proud of. It is, they say, the best car we've ever made. No pressure then. To understand its significance, we'll need to press the rewind button for a moment and shuttle back to 1997. Ford's family hatch contender during this period was the fifth generation Escort, a car so all-encompassingly woeful that the brand was almost embarrassed to sell it. When the time came for a replacement, everyone expected something better. But what we got in the Focus model first launched in 1998 was something much, much more than that. A contender that at a stroke offered arguably the biggest step forward in family car design the market has ever seen. Here at last was technology directed firmly at the man in the street, who in this apparently humble family hatchback could experience a car more entertaining and rewarding to drive than almost anything this side of a sizable lottery win. It was asking a lot for the Mark II model we saw in 2005 to repeat such a seismic step forward, but that second generation Focus was still quite good enough to remain acclaimed as the driver's choice against rival Astras and Golfs that made up for their dynamic failings with a better ride and a more luxurious big car feel. These were attributes the Focus needed too, and when it came to developing the Mark III version, first launched early in 2011, then updated in 2015, Ford tried to provide them without compromising the car's class-leading handling. That's also been the goal with this more sophisticated Mark IV model, announced in the spring of 2018. It's about the same size as before, and though this lighter, stronger bodywork may not look too different, it clothes an all-new C2 platform that enables a longer wheelbase that, for the first time, allows this car to offer properly class-competitive rear seat room and luggage space. Much has changed beneath the bonnet too, with clever cylinder deactivation for the petrol models and the all-new 1.5-litre three-cylinder petrol unit we first saw in the Fiesta ST. The diesel engines are new too, so is the much higher quality cabin, which features half the number of previous buttons. On top of all that, the brand claims class-leading camera-driven safety standards too. This car does, in short, promise the kind of significant step forward that'll be absolutely necessary if Ford is to retain its place amongst the sales leaders in this segment. Time to put this car to the test. This fourth generation Focus does, we're told, share the same DNA as the original model we saw two decades ago. Has any version of this car entertained quite as much since? Possibly not, though this Ford has still managed throughout that time to hold on to its mantle as the best handling contender in this category. The driving position, the feedback through the wheel, and in particular the way the car responds as you throw it into a corner. All these things have long represented a benchmark in the family hatchback segment. And the Blue Oval brand claims to have further developed them to keep this Mark IV model ahead of the chasing pack. It all sounds promising, though at the outset of this test we couldn't help thinking that if Ford had really wanted to replicate the spirit of its original Focus design, it would have standardised proper multi-link rear suspension across the range, as that car did. 
as it is, this model lineup, like the previous one, continues to replicate the penny-pinching strategy of Volkswagen Group models in equipping the lower-powered variants that most customers buy with a much cheaper torsion beam suspension setup, which is what we're trying here. Ford says we shouldn't worry about that, claiming even this basic damping system to be, in its way, quite sophisticated thanks to the inclusion of the patented so-called force vectoring springs for the rear axle that the brand originally developed for its Fiesta ST hot hatch. These are cleverly bent into their fittings so as to be able to apply a stabilizing lateral force onto the rear wheels, as well as performing their usual load-bearing tasks. With these in place, it was possible to specify softer ride bushes without damaging the taut, responsive cornering stability that Ford wanted this family hatch to have. As a result, we found that this car offers a firm but reasonably friendly demeanour to your lower spine over tarmac tears, though it certainly doesn't ride them with the ease and fluidity that you get from the more powerful multi-link suspended variants. Still, uh, the new C2 platform's 20% increase in torsional rigidity, plus even more responsive EPAS electric steering and a brilliantly tactile shift quality from the manual transmission, all combine to leave you minded to overlook any remaining damping deficiencies. And in the right circumstances, push on through the bends with the kind of confidence you wouldn't normally expect a contender in this class to be able to give you. The handling further assisted by very even more finely tuned aspects of electronic assistance. Things like torque steer compensation, a subtler stability control setup, and torque vectoring control to get the power down through the bends. It all combines to create a car that really can still reward at the wheel, even in its most affordable forms. There's still nothing else in this segment that feels quite the same get out of one of these, then go and drive a rival Astra or a Golf. We think you'll find that it'll feel a little dull by comparison. Now, we should get on to engines because quite a lot's changed beneath the bonnet this time round, though the fewest alterations have been made to the unit that apparently 63% of focus buyers choose, the one litre three cylinder EcoBoost turbo petrol power plant that we're trying here. It comes in 85 PS, 100 PS, and as in this case, 125 PS states of tune and now gets cylinder deactivation for extra frugality. Now as before, you have to keep this engine on the boil at 2000 RPM or above to keep it feeling flexible. And also as before, one litre EcoBoost Focus motoring comes with a distinctive soundtrack, complete with the kind of offbeat thrum that tends to characterise three cylinder power. If the engineers had added a balancer shaft, as Peugeot and Citroen models do with their rival three-port units, then refinement would have been improved. Still, a dual-mass flywheel helps to quell the worst cabin vibrations, and anyway, the sound isn't particularly unpleasant. In fact, it makes the car feel sportier than it actually is. Or at least it does, providing you avoid the entry-level 85 PS variant, which takes nearly 14 seconds to amble up to 62 miles an hour. Better is the 100 PS unit, which improves those figures to 12.5 seconds and 112 miles an hour. If you can stretch to this 125 PS derivative, this little engine additionally features an overboost function that gives you an extra 30 PS for easier overtaking, and 62 miles an hour is reached in 10.3 seconds on the way to 123 miles an hour. Whatever your choice between the three one litre variants, once you're on a proper give and take road, this car can really shine. Get the engine singing, and it's hard to believe that you're working with just 999cc beneath the bonnet. Your alternative route for motive power at the foot of the Focus range is the brand's latest 1.5 litre EcoBlue diesel unit, which comes in 95 and 120 PS flavours and uses low inertia turbocharging, said to help make it more responsive and quieter than the engine it directly replaces. To be frank, it's still a bit rumbly, but if you're not amongst those with a pathological objection to black pump fuel, you might well like the way that this unit produces nearly double the mid-range pulling power uh, compared to base versions of the one litre petrol power plant. 62 miles an hour from rest in the 95 PS EcoBlue version occupies 11.4 seconds en route to 140 miles an hour. 
62 miles an hour from rest in the 95 PS 1.5 litre diesel eco blue version occupies 11.4 seconds on the way to 114 miles an hour. Figures that the 120 PS variant improves to 10 seconds dead and 122 miles an hour. So, those are all your engine options on a focus specified with the more basic of the two suspension setups. If you're able to stretch to one of the more powerful units though, as mentioned earlier, Ford will favour you with its much more sophisticated control blade multi-link rear damping package. In the mainstream part of the range, two engines come mated to this setup. The first is a 2 litre 150 PS EcoBlue diesel unit that the brand thinks only 1% of buyers will choose, with many of those likely to be attracted by the towing benefits delivered by this unit's useful 370 newton metre torque output. In a manual 2 litre EcoBlue diesel model, 62 miles an hour takes 8.5 seconds on the way to 130 miles an hour. We though would recommend focus buyers in search of extra performance to prioritise another freshly developed engine, this one better suited to the kind of car this is, a 1.5 litre EcoBoost petrol unit, another piece of engineering borrowed from that Fiesta ST hot hatch. As with that car it usually puts out 150 PS, but thanks to further use of cylinder deactivation you don't have to throw away your efficiency priorities to choose it. This is another three cylinder power plant, but it's far gutsier than the one litre unit, putting out 240 newton metres of torque and making 62 miles an hour in 8.8 .8 seconds on the way to 130 miles an hour. If that's not enough, then an alternative 182 PS version of this power plant improves those figures to 8.3 seconds and 138 miles an hour. Beyond that lies the even more potent 2.3 litre EcoBoost petrol engine used in the Focus ST hot hatch, but we'll need to cover that in a separate film. Whatever engine you choose beneath the bonnet, you'll want to get to grips with Ford's standard drive mode system to get the most from it. This borrows the kind of technology we've long seen on premium badged models in this segment, using normal, sport and eco settings to alter steering feel, throttle response and on auto variants, gear shift timings to suit the way that you want to drive. If you take up the option that upmarket variants will offer of continuously controlled damping, you'll also get extra comfort and eco comfort modes. Paying the extra for that adaptive damping system is probably unnecessary, unless perhaps you've opted for the sporty ST Lion trim level, which has mandatory stiffened sports suspension. With all this talk of sportiness, it's easy to overlook the reality that most motoring writers seem to ignore, namely that the majority of Focus customers don't really place any serious dynamic demands on this car at all. These people will probably be more interested in the news that the stiffer chassis and sleeker bodywork have combined to slightly improve cruising refinement. They might take a look at Ford's latest 8-speed auto gearbox which adapts to your driving style, or approvingly consider the fact that a new electric brake booster has taken up to a metre off this car's stopping distance. They could like the idea of an optional adaptive cruise control setup that can take over the driving duties on the highway. And there's more than a possibility of interest in the now improved Active Park Assist system that can take over steering, throttle and braking duties while automatically manoeuvring you into either parallel or perpendicular spaces. In short, whatever your driving priorities, this Focus aims to have something compelling to offer which is probably why so many people like it. Here's a car that's grown up, matured in almost every way. You might, like us, wish that Ford had been a touch more adventurous about this fourth generation Focus model's design, but you can see at a glance that it better meets the key criteria for the kind of car a family hatchback should be. The wheels are further apart, the glass area is larger, the overhang shorter. All of this part of the brand's current human-centric design philosophy. Now, to some extent, that works. Put this improved focus next to its predecessor, and it certainly looks a more expensive proposition. Ford's objective was to take this car closer to its arch rival Volkswagen's Golf in terms of visual sophistication and make switching into this model a little easier for those afflicted with any kind of badge snobbery. 
key to this will be front end overtaking presence and sure enough design director Amco Lienart's styling team have made sure that the grille is larger and more confident though its lower section is now partly obscured by the repositioned number plate. The boomerang shaped cutouts for the fog lamps add a touch of extra purpose to the nose and just above sit headlamps that can feature full LED technology adapting themselves to the road ahead and other motorists. They're placed as far into the corners of the car as possible to maximise the vehicle's width and stance flowing up into a longer flowing bonnet featuring twin creases on either side. When it comes to the really significant changes made to this fourth generation model though, you'll learn more from a profile perspective, especially if you choose this five door hatch body style over the alternative estate variant. Gone is the previous overtly wedge shaped silhouette, replaced instead by one in which these A pillars have been placed further back with longer front wings and wheels of up to 18 inches in size that are positioned higher into the sheet metal to reduce the perception of visual mass. If you were viewing one of these alongside its predecessor, you might also notice the 15 millimeter lower roof line and this much more athletic sculpting that sees one flowing crease drop down over the front door handle and another ease out of the panel work of the rear door to give the haunches some extra shape and purpose. At the rear, the main change is the adoption of these much larger two-piece tail lamps, which can feature full LED technology further up the range. Plus, the bumper's now been styled with a bit more flair, incorporating these corner reflectors. As usual though, what's more important is the stuff you can't see, namely the completely new, lighter, stiffer and stronger C2 structure that lies beneath the curvier panel work and which will underpin a whole new generation of similarly sized Ford models, including the Mark III Cougar SUV. Let's take a seat up front where Ford hopes you'll find the ambience of this fourth generation model much more inviting. To that end, the dashboard has been pulled forward and there's a slimmer lower centre console, plus that new body shell has freed up more room for shoulders and knees. As a result, you no longer feel quite so hemmed in at the wheel. But by the same token, there's also slightly less of the cockpit style positioning that we rather liked before. You can't fault the cleaner, sharper ergonomics though, aided by a massive 50% reduction in button clutter, with as many functions as possible relocated to this prominent SYNC 3 infotainment screen that, in keeping with current automotive fashion, sprouts from the top of the dash. Quality is taking a decent step forward too, with smart metallic highlights and soft touch materials covering most of the higher surface areas, while harder, scratchier panels are generally banished to lower areas that you'll rarely touch. Flock line storage areas, this smart concertinaing storage tray lid between the seats, an electronic handbrake, and these elegant fascia trimming strips also aim to lift this cabin a bit. Despite all of Ford's efforts though, you still wouldn't quite think you were in a Volkswagen Group product. It's just a few little touches that make the difference. Would you get fake door stitching or a center console box fashioned from a cheap plastic molding in a Golf? We think not. You could argue that the graphics of this center dash screen aren't quite as sharp as those of the rival Wolfsburg product too, though there's not much in it. And in terms of functionality, the Ford setup is difficult to fault. Infotainment options with this car vary depending on the model you choose. There are 4.2, 6.5, or as in this case, eight inch screen sizes, all featuring logical menus and the proper rotary volume and zoom controls that some rival systems have unwisely dispensed with. The two bigger monitors you can have both showcase Ford's latest SYNC 3 technology, which allows for easy app integration and functionality that enables you to duplicate the operation of your smartphone onto the central fascia screen via either Apple CarPlay or the MirrorLink Android Auto system. If you're not familiar with the SYNC package, it doesn't take long to adjust to it with the central dash monitor divided into sections that allow you to activate audio, phone, and where fitted, sat-nav functions via touchscreen icons. 
Heating and ventilation is thankfully covered off by separate switch gear further down the centre stack, which is just as well since the display icons on the monitor can be a little fiddly to use, despite the inclusion of smartphone style pinch and swipe functionality. Instead of stabbing away at the screen graphics, it's better to try and master the system's impressive voice-activated functionality that enables you to issue simple one-shot commands. Simply by saying phrases like, I need a coffee, I need petrol, or I need to park, you can easily locate nearby cafes, petrol stations, or car parks, and find destinations like train stations, airports, and hotels. With a bigger screen, you also get a clever Ford Pass Connect package that offers live traffic updates and Wi-Fi connectivity via a built-in modem. Anything this display can't tell you will be covered off by a further screen provided between the instrument dials. It's 4.2 inches in size in plusher models like this one and features audio, phone, trip computer, digital speedio, uh, driver assist and navigation settings. It's all very clear and informative and, along with these sharply defined gauges, makes rather unnecessary the optional head-up display we have here that projects its images onto a rising glass panel below the base of the windscreen. Now, you view the instrument binnacle through this smarter, higher quality three-spoke steering wheel, which, like the seat, features an impressively wide range of adjustment. With the original first generation version of this car, Ford made great play about having created a design that could be comfortably driven by anyone between 4 foot 9 and 6 foot 9. And ever since, the Focus has remained a great choice for any size or shape of potential owner. True to form, this version feels right from the moment that you get behind the wheel, thanks to near-perfect driver positioning and supportive bolstering, particularly if you get a version fitted with this 18-way adjustable comfort spec seat. Thin A-pillars and properly placed pedals also help. Rearward vision's pretty uncluttered too, which is just as well, because you have to stretch quite a way up the range to get standard rear parking sensors. Here we've gone a stage further by trying an improved active park assist system able to steer you into either parallel or perpendicular spaces at the press of a button. The more we've lived with this car, the more we've appreciated the little touches that Ford has thought so much about this time round. The optional B&O Play 10 speaker audio system we've been trying here is a great addition to the range, but less obvious things have also contributed much to our enjoyment of this fourth generation model. For example, nearly all focuses include important features that you probably have to pay extra for on the more affordable versions of rival cars in this segment. Um, things like a driver's seat lumbar adjustment and a quick clear heated windscreen for frosty mornings. You also get an electronic handbrake, not our favourite modern era automotive development, but one that does undeniably free up a useful amount of extra cabin stowage space between the seats. In this area, there's a coin tray behind the handbrake switch, and to the left of it, that sliding cover that we referred to earlier, which conceals a couple of cup holders. While we're talking cabin storage, we'll tell you that the door pockets are a touch on the small side, but that you do get an overhead compartment for your sunglasses, a further cubby by the driver's right knee, and a storage area at the base of the center stack that includes USB and 12 volt ports, plus an optional wireless phone charging mat. The lidded storage bin between the seats we referred to earlier includes a lift out uh, tray, a pen clip and a USB port. Illuminated vanity mirrors are built into both sun visors as are ticket clips and you get a reasonably sized glove box too, though unfortunately this area can't be cooled. All of which is interesting, but perhaps not quite so fundamentally significant as the changes which have taken place further back in this fourth generation model. Let's be frank, the rear seat space you got in the previous version of this Focus wasn't really that much different to the kind of thing on offer from larger super minis in the next class down. Will 18 millimeters of additional exterior length and a 53 millimeter wheelbase increase this time round be enough to change that? Yes is the answer. The space on offer here certainly doesn't redefine what the family hatchback segment can offer, but it does at least now typify it. 
in a Focus, backseat folk are at last now treated much as they would be in a rival Golf, thanks to 56 millimeters more knee clearance, 78 millimeters more legroom, and 60 millimeters more shoulder room. Plus, there's decent foot space beneath the front seats. We've appreciated the improvement in rear sideward visibility too. Uh, when seated back here in the previous model, your view to the side was blocked by the C-pillar in a way that it now no longer is. We also approve of this low centre transmission tunnel, though a centre seated adult will still be as relatively uncomfortable on longer trips as he or she would normally be in such a position in a car of this class. What else? Well, it's a pity the more affordable models don't get this center armrest, which has the usual dual cup holder mouldings. On the plus side though, all variants offer decently sized rear door pockets, uh, outer Isofix child seat attachments, netted seat back storage areas, and a center 12 volt port, though a USB point would arguably be more useful. The larger expanse of side window glass makes this part of the cabin feel airier too, something you can further emphasize by specifying the optional panoramic glass roof, though that will reduce the otherwise very acceptable headroom levels by a few inches. Let's finish by taking a look at the cargo area, pausing on the way in pulling out these wide opening doors to notice these neat optional door edge protectors that pop out to protect car park dings. And the easy fuel filler neck designed as usual on Ford cars to make it impossible for you to inadvertently put diesel into a petrol model or vice versa. Ah yes, the boot. At Car and Driving, we seem to be just about the only reviewers who properly highlighted the fact that on previous Focus models, the space you got back here was bordering on the unacceptable for a car of this size. With the hatch version of that old car, if you had a spare wheel fitted, you got just 277 litres of capacity, a figure only just above Fiesta-style Super Mini territory. Now, from an initial glance at the stats, things do seem a bit better this time round. Uh, with a Mini spare fitted, there's 341 litres available if you load to window level, or 375 litres with a tyre repair kit, which is about the class norm. That can fall to as little as 273 litres though, if, as a large proportion of Focus models will, you have either a full-size spare or the upgraded B&O audio system fitted. A typically specified estate model fitted with a mini spare offers up to 575 litres, so much more, or as much as 728 litres if you load to the roof. If you stick with this hatch variant, you will at least find that this area is practically sized and accessed via a lowish loading lip. A bulky pram and up to five carry-on suitcases will certainly fit. There are the usual couple of bag hooks and, as expected, four tie-down points. An adjustable height boot floor, standard on the estate, is unfortunately only optional on selected hatch models. And you can't have it at all if you've specified continuously controlled damping, a full-size spare, or the B&O audio system. Should you go for that desirable stereo package, as we have here, you'll find that its subwoofer takes up most of the space beneath the boot floor. There's no ski hatch for longer items unless you stretch all the way up to pricey Vignale trim. If you need more room and want to push forward the 60-40 split rear bench, then between 1,250 and 1,320 litres of space can be freed up in this hatch model, depending on the size of spare wheel you decide upon. An estate fitted with a mini spare will give you up to 1,620 litres, thanks to 175 millimetres of extra loading length this time round, and an extra 43 millimetres of roof height for this generation model, uh, an increase apparently calculated so as to enable owners to comfortably accommodate a dog crate. Go for that station wagon variant and auto folding, easy fold rear seat backs come as standard. Plus, you can have a gesture controlled powered tailgate if you're prepared to pay extra for it. Ford claims to have been a little more realistic with pricing this time round, pointing to a range starting figure which from launch was around 18,000 pounds. 
The variants that most will actually want though don't undercut their direct predecessors by all that much, selling in the usual 20 to 30,000 pound bracket. As before, there are two body styles, this five door hatch, or for a model for model premium of a thousand pounds, a more versatile estate option. An eight speed automatic gearbox is an option across virtually the whole range for an extra 1,350 pounds. Ford claims to have reduced the number of orderable focus configurations by 92% this time round, but the vast model lineup still takes a bit of getting your head around. Basically, in the mainstream range, there are a couple of budget-minded model lines, that's Style and Z-Tech, then three luxury-orientated variants, uh, Titanium, this Titanium X version, and Top Vignale, plus a couple of sport models, ST-Line and ST-Line X. There's also an SUV style active version with crossover styling cues and a raised ride height. And you can ask your dealer about a fully fledged ST hot hatch derivative too. As Volkswagen does with its rival Golf model, Ford provides a cheaper, more straightforward suspension setup for its lesser powered engines. So the one litre EcoBoost petrol and 1.5 litre EcoBlue diesel models that the majority of buyers will select feature a straightforward torsion beam system, which is the only package that you can have if you select a base style or ZTEC variant. Of the two base power plants, most will choose the 1 litre EcoBoost petrol option, available with either 85, 100, or as here, 125 PS. If you can afford a little more and enjoy your driving, then you can go for one of the more powerful engines that come fitted with more sophisticated control blade multi-link rear suspension. Now these include a 150 PS 2 litre EcoBlue diesel and an all new 1.5 litre 3 cylinder EcoBoost petrol option offered with either 150 or 182 PS. On to the value proposition all of that represents. Let's start with this car's two chief family hatchback segment rivals. Traditionally a Focus has costed a little more than a Vauxhall Astra and a little less than a Volkswagen Golf and not too much has changed there. Most of Ford's engine technology is now a little ahead of Vauxhall, so you might be inclined to accept a premium for that. As to whether you'd pay a thousand to two thousand pounds more than that Ford will charge you for this car to own a directly comparable Volkswagen Golf, well, this Focus has now closed the gap in quality to its German rival. If Focus residual values improve to reflect this, then justifying the extra spend required to own a Golf in this segment could get increasingly harder to do. But what about the two cheaper Volkswagen Group mainstream family hatchbacks that use Golf technology, say it's Leon and Skoda's Octavia? Well, what about them? Once you've poured over the price lists, you'll find that the savings that most like-for-like -like Leon and Octavia models offer over this Focus are slight, at which point this Ford's superior driving dynamics come into play. The same is true of potential rivals like Honda Civic, uh, the Mazda 3, or Toyota's Corolla. The Focus certainly needs its handling trump card, for there are other rivals in this segment that do offer tempting list price savings. Some versions of Peugeot's very complete 308 will cost you less when you do direct like-for-like -like engine comparisons, with the same going for that car's soft-riding stablemate, Citroen's C4 Cactus. You could also save a few hundred pounds by choosing one of the Korean options, Kia Seed or Hyundai's i30 both of which come with sophisticated multi-link rear suspension right across the range. Or potentially save a few thousand by selecting a low volume player in this segment like Nissan's Pulsar or Fiat's Tipo. In all these cases though, you can't help continually coming back to the fact that a Focus is better to drive and often also cheaper to run. It'll offer you a wider range of model and engine options, and the technology it delivers remains a step ahead of many rivals. If, having considered all of this, you conclude that it is this Ford that you really want in this segment, then you're gonna need to know just how generous the Blue Oval brand has been when it comes to the standard spec. Well, you be the judge. Even if you can only afford to buy into the range at base style level, you still get a reasonable amount. 
tick off 16 inch alloy wheels, LED daytime running lamps, auto headlamps, a Thatcham category one alarm, and a mini spare wheel rather than one of those irritating tire repair kits. Plus, you get the usual neat Ford specific touches. Things like the easy fuel system that stops you pumping in the wrong kind of fuel and the Ford MyKey system that enables you to program various parameters into a spare ignition key so that if you loan your car out, say to your son or daughter, you can restrict the speed at which they drive and even the stereo volume they choose. My key can even disable the car altogether if driver and passengers are not using safety belts. It can also prevent the driver from deactivating safety technologies like stability control. Inside a base style spec focus, there's manual air conditioning, a trip computer, an electronic parking brake, and quite a rare feature to find at entry level in a car like this, lumbar support for the driver's seat. There are selectable drive modes that alter steering feel, throttle response, and on auto variance, gear shift timings too. And infotainment that gives you a 4.2 inch TFT center dash color screen via which you access Bluetooth and a six speaker DAB stereo. Estate versions get roof rails and all variants come complete with an extensive roster of camera driven safety kit, which we'll get to in a moment. Only just over 1.3% of buyers are expected to buy into the range at this entry level point though. It's far more likely that you'll be considering the next trim level up, ZTEC, which accounts for a fifth of all focus sales in our market. You'll have to stretch at least to this level in the range to get Ford's latest SYNC 3 infotainment technology, which includes Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring and works via a floating 6.5 inch color screen mounted on top of the dash. ZTEC variants are recognizable by their front fog lights and a smarter chromed finish on the upper door line. Inside at this level, you get sports style front seats, a center console with an armrest, uh, leather for the steering wheel and gear knob, and a useful quick clear heated windscreen. So that's covered the volume part of the range, but let's say that you want something a bit nicer. Well, let's look at what's included with the various more luxuriously orientated models. Mid-range titanium spec gets you a chrome framed front grille, front and rear parking sensors, rain sensing wipers, LED rear lights, and keyless entry. Inside, there are heated front seats, ambient lighting, a 4.2 inch color screen between the two main instrument cluster dials, climate control, an auto dimming rear view mirror, and a rear center armrest. Plus the SYNC 3 center dash infotainment setup gets a larger eight inch monitor so that it can incorporate a navigation system. It also includes the clever Ford Pass Connect package that gives you onboard Wi-Fi and live traffic information. Now here, we've got a Titanium X variant, which along with that tally, further adds larger 17 inch 10 by two spoke alloy wheels, rear privacy glass, partial leather trim, and a power adjustable driver's seat. We think hard before paying the significant amount Ford wants for the top Vignali variants, though the beautiful stitched leather upholstery you get with these derivatives certainly feels very upmarket. We're less sure about the artificial wood that Vignale versions include around the dash. At this level in the range, there's a bespoke front grille, uh, 18 inch wheels, full LED headlights and door edge protectors. While inside at this level in the lineup, that Vignale leather seat trim is complemented by special floor mats, a heated steering wheel and multicolored LED ambient lighting, as well as a head up display, an active park assist system, a rear wide view camera, a load through ski hatch and a 10 speaker 675 watt B&O Play premium audio system with 360 degree sound. What else? Well, Earlier, we mentioned that there were some sporty ST-Line and ST-Line X mainstream options in the range, derivatives which Ford thinks could account for nearly half of the total Focus sales mix. Both versions get a full body styling kit with a big rear spoiler, polished twin tailpipes, sports tuned suspension, LED front fog lights that turn with the bends, 
and special alloy wheels. 17 inches on the ST Lion and 18 inch matte black rims on the ST Lion X. The ST Lion variants have a flat bottom steering wheel with red stitching that also extends around the interior, plus alloy finish pedals, a dark headliner, a keyless start button, and on manual models, an aluminium gear knob. To this tally, the ST Lion X variants add red brake calipers, plus a selection of titanium style luxury features, uh, things like uh, uh, the powered driver's seat adjustment, climate control, the 4.2 inch instrument binnacle screen, heated front seats with partial leather trim, an auto dimming rear view mirror, all round parking sensors, power folding mirrors, and rear privacy glass. Plus, ST Line X buyers also get the larger 8 inch size SYNC 3 center dash touchscreen with navigation and that forward pass connect Wi Fi and traffic information package. Enough on standard spec. Let's say that you've decided on the focus trim level you want. Are there some key options that you'll need to set aside some extra budget for? Well, quite possibly, yes you're probably going to want what Ford calls the second load floor that's standard on the estate but only optional on the five door hatch variant. This adjustable height boot floor isn't offered with the lesser style or ZTEC trim levels and there won't be room for it if you've a car with a full size spare wheel or the upgraded B&O audio system. Now that B&O setup is a desirable option on the luxury orientated models and while we're on infotainment, bear in mind that you'll have to pay extra for the larger 8 inch center dash screen with navigation and that Ford Pass Connect Wi Fi package if you go for the popular ZTEC and ST Lion trim variants. Moving on to driver stuff, there's Ford's adaptive damping system called Continuous Control Damping, which allows you to tweak suspension feel to suit the way that you want to drive. Unfortunately though, this feature is only available on the priciest ST Line X, Titanium X and Vignale variants. As for other things we'd really like as a focus buyer, well, with a style ZTEC or Titanium trimmed model, we'd want to pay extra for the Comfort front seats with their 18-way adjustment. Buyers of the more affordable models may want to specify front and rear parking sensors, or even better, the optional convenience pack that we've got here, which gives you a rear wide view camera, along with door edge protectors and an active park assist system that automatically steers you into spaces. On top ST Line X and Titanium X trim levels, you'll be offered the option of two Vignale level features, uh, the head up display and full LED headlights. And an extra cost, those LED headlamps can be specified in adaptive glare free form if you've stretched to either ST Line X or Vignale trim. Further up the range, you might also like to look at paying extra for niceties like keyless entry, an openable panoramic glass roof, and a heated steering wheel. Buyers of the estate variant can specify a powered tailgate too. And there's an optional wireless charging pad for your phone, which can on request be combined with an ACV QI protective charging case for Apple phones. Bear in mind that you're probably going to need to pay your dealer extra for your chosen paint colour. Solid Race Red is the only shade that comes as standard. There are various premium and exclusive metallic bodywork shades to select from. We've got chrome blue here and a range of optional 16, 17 and 18 inch alloy wheel designs. ZTEC spec buyers can also specify an appearance pack which includes rear privacy glass and special 17 inch wheels with a shadow black machined finish. Practical options for the cargo area include a boot liner, a reversible load compartment mat and a load retention net. You can also specify a rear bumper protector to guard against scratches when you're sliding heavy stuff in and out. If you're uh, activity orientated, you might want to look at a bike pack carrier that goes with the crossbars that you can specify for the roof. Plus, there are the usual tow bars, uh, roof boxes, wind deflectors, uh, mud flaps and carpet mats. Okay, enough with general spec and options. Let's move on to take a look at this car's safety provision and decide whether there's any substance to Ford's claim that this car now leads its class in this regard. 
Now, perhaps the highlight here is that all Focus models now come with autonomous emergency braking. Ford calls its system pre-collision assist with pedestrian detection. As usual with these kinds of setups, this one works as you drive to scan the road ahead for potential collision hazards with a particular focus on pedestrians. It even works at night. If something that you might be about to hit is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, then the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Should you still manage to have a collision, a post-collision braking system automatically applies the brakes to try and help avoid the car spinning off to hit something else. There's also a lane keeping alert system that warns you if you veer out of lane and a lane keeping aid that will automatically steer you gently back to where you should be. And Ford provides an intelligent speed assist speed limiter to help you keep safe and legal through urban areas. In addition, the infotainment packages, as usual, include an emergency assist feature that'll automatically alert the emergency services if the airbags go off in an accident. Now, with a normal SYNC 3 equipped variant, this potentially life-saving technology will only work if your phone is Bluetooth connected. But if you have a focus with the bigger 8-inch screen sat-nav system and Ford Pass Connect package fitted, then after a collision, the car will be able to automatically place an e-call to the emergency services for you, regardless of phone status. What else? Well, as you'd expect in this day and age, all models include ESP stability control, traction control, and an ABS braking system with EBA emergency brake assist for panic stops. There are also the usual twin front, side, and curtain airbags. Um, now, take all of these many and varied safety features into account, and you'll not be surprised to hear that this car achieved a full house five-star overall safety rating from Euro NCAP, who specifically gave it a very creditable 85% rating for adult occupant protection and an 87% rating for child occupant protection. If you still want to go further, as an extra option on most models, it's also possible to order a blind spot information system with cross traffic alert set up. Now this works on the move to warn you if you're about to pull out to overtake when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. And it also warns you of oncoming traffic when you're reversing out of a parking space. We'd also recommend that you take a look at the optional driver assistance pack where the key feature is an adaptive cruise control setup, which not only keeps you a safe distance from the car in front on the highway, but also includes lane centering assist that'll subtly apply steering correction to keep you in the center of your lane. This is about the closest this Focus can get to autonomous driving tech. Now, that driver assistance pack also includes various other camera driven features. Uh, driver alert, which monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness, uh, evasive steering assist, which helps drivers steer around stopped or slower vehicles to help avoid collisions, auto high beam, which automatically dips your headlights at night in the face of oncoming traffic, and traffic sign recognition, which reads speed signs displaying them on the dash as you pass. That speed sign information can then combine with navigation data so that the intelligent speed assist speed limiter that we mentioned earlier can be programmed to automatically set itself whenever you enter a speed limited zone, not allowing you to exceed the legal figure. That way, you should never get a speeding ticket ever again. Well, in theory anyway. Don't you just love technology? It's obviously crucial for Ford to get its cost of ownership sums right, hence the changes made to the engineering of this fourth generation Focus that see improvements of up to 10% in fuel efficiency across the range. Now, a key factor in achieving this has been the introduction of cylinder deactivation technology on the three-cylinder petrol power plants that the majority of buyers will probably choose. You might be familiar with this sort of thing from larger engines, but if you're not, 
will tell you that at less than 50% throttle and between 1500 and 4500 RPM, one cylinder is shut off, improving fuel consumption. So Ford says by as much as 6%. The system can disengage or re-engage the cylinder in question, the middle one, in just 14 milliseconds, 20 times faster than the blink of an eye. And the transition either way is so seamless that you won't feel or hear it. We couldn't anyway. Added to that are the efficiency benefits that come with design improvements like sleeker bodywork. There's a best in class 0.25 CD drag factor. Um, air curtain technology to reduce turbulence around the wheels. A new C2 platform that on its own saves 88 kilograms of weight and an engine start stop system. Take all of this into account and you begin to understand the reasoning behind Ford's assertion that in real world driving terms, this Mark IV model Focus is significantly more efficient than its predecessor. That's despite this model's extra equipment and the stronger, stiffer body. The official stats don't really show that because they're now measured using the current, now more stringent WLTP, Worldwide Harmonized Light Vehicle Test Procedure. But believe us, it's true. Let's get to the quoted readings, all of which we'll quote on the basis of a five-door hatch variant with manual transmission and the smallest wheels available for any given version. Starting with the 1-litre EcoBoost petrol 100 and 125 PS petrol derivatives, which tend to be the most popular in the range. These respectively manage 60.1 and 58.9 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and around 108 grams per kilometre of CO2. The base 85 PS version of this engine manages 58.9 mpg and 110 grams per kilometer. To do better in a budget orientated focus model, you'll need to switch your attention to the 1.5 liter EcoBlue diesel unit, which has quite an efficiency orientated engineering CV. Tick off low pressure exhaust gas recirculation, an integrated intake manifold for optimized engine breathing, a high pressure fuel injection system, and low inertia turbocharging. The result of all this effort sees the 95 PS version of this unit record 80.7 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 91 grams per kilometer of CO2, while for the 125 PS variant of the same unit, it's 78.5 miles to the gallon and 94 grams per kilometer. The result of all this effort sees the 95 PS version of this unit record 80.7 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 91 grams per kilometre of CO2, while for the 120 PS variant of the same unit it's 78.5 miles to the gallon and 94 grams per kilometre. There's also a 2 litre EcoBlue diesel option with 150 PS. Here the figures are 64.2 miles to the gallon and 114 grams per kilometre. Your other mainstream focus engine option is another three-cylinder petrol unit. This one 1.5 litres in size and putting out either 150 or 182 PS. Not so long ago, that kind of output would have produced efficiency readings so mediocre that sales volumes for such a powertrain would have been low. This engine has been designed around much more of a frugal remit though. We've already mentioned its clever cylinder deactivation system that'll see you running on just a couple of cylinders for much of the time. Plus, it also includes an integrated exhaust manifold that improves fuel efficiency by helping the engine reach optimal temperatures faster. All aluminium construction means that it's notably light too, all of which helps to explain the readings you get. 53.3 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 121 grams per kilometre of CO2 for the 150 PS variant. It's 51.4 miles to the gallon and 126 grams per kilometre for the minority interest 182 PS version of this unit. Bear in mind with all the engines that if you choose the optional 8-speed auto gearbox, you'll hit your efficiency readings by around 10% which isn't the case if you go for a Volkswagen Group model with DSG auto transmission. Whatever focus derivative you decide upon, it's reasonable to wonder whether these quoted returns are really achievable in real world everyday motoring. I raise this issue because some have doubted this point and it's certainly true that the 1 litre T EcoBoost power plant I'm trying here requires a more efficiency orientated driving approach if you're to get close to the running cost returns that it's supposed to be able to achieve. Fortunately, Ford's technology aids you here. 
The standard drive mode system includes an eco setting which adjusts the throttle and engine settings to give the best economy possible. Also helping is an active grille shutter which sees slats in the front grille remaining closed at startup so that the power plant can more quickly warm up to its optimum operating temperature. On the move, the flaps can open or shut for optimum aerodynamic efficiency. What else? Uh, well, we'll tell you about servicing, which on all engines is required every two years or 18,000 miles, whichever comes first. Two prepaid servicing plans are available, one that costs £340 and covers you for two years and two services. Uh, and there's another that costs £550 and is transferable to future owners and covers three years and three services. Uh, maintenance bookings can be done online through the My Ford portal. This is part of the Ford Blue service scheme that wraps up all of the care and maintenance of your car into one bundle uh, that includes a free 30-point e-check of vital parts and highlights any work required with a red, amber and green traffic light warning to rank items that need attention in order of importance. There's also the Ford service app that you can download to your phone for free. It lets you locate your nearest dealer and make a booking, plus has a couple of extra elements allowing you to find petrol stations and including a park me feature that remembers where you left your focus so you won't have to hunt for it, say in busy multi-stories. As for the warranty, well, like all Fords, this one comes with a 36-month, 60,000-mile package that also includes one year of Europe-wide breakdown assistance. On top of that, there's an anti-corrosion guarantee for 12 years. Ford also offers the chance to extend this cover to either 4 years and 80,000 miles or 5 years and 100,000 miles. On to insurance. If you're looking at the 1 litre EcoBoost petrol engine, the 85 PS variant is rated at Group 5E, while the 100 PS derivative is rated at Group 80. Go for the 125 PS model we're trying here, and you're looking at Group 12E, 13E, or 14E, depending on the variant that you select. As for the alternative 1.5 litre EcoBlue diesel engine, then you're looking at Group 12E or 13E for it in its 95 PS form, or Group 14E, 15E or 16E if you go for this 1.5 litre diesel in its 120 PS guise. What about if you want a more powerful mainstream focus model? Well, the 1.5 litre EcoBoost petrol engine that we'd recommend in 150 PS form is rated at Group 16E or 18E if you go for Vignale trim. The 182 PS version of this 1.5 litre petrol is rated at Group 18E. As for the 2 litre diesel Eco Blue, it's rated at Group 18E or 20E if you go for Vignale trim. Finally, let's consider the question of residual values. This area has never been a focus strength, but experts predict that this Mark IV model will perform much better than its predecessor. To be specific, after the usual three-year, 36,000-mile period, a volume ST Line 1 litre EcoBoost 125 PS variant should still be worth nearly 40% of what you originally paid for it, which, if achieved, would be a significant improvement on anything that the previous generation version of this car was able to manage. Has any car had more of an impact on modern era motoring than the Ford Focus? With over two million examples of this car pounding British roads, it's hard to argue the point. It's been our market's second best seller in the last 10 years behind only Ford's Fiesta and the top seller in this country for nine years in the last 20. These are seriously impressive stats and there's reason behind them. Other manufacturers can better this car in some regards, but they still can't make their family hatchback contenders drive like a Focus. It's true that there are some caveats in that regard. The lower powered models with their more basic torsion beam suspension setup don't have quite as fluid a feel as those further up the range that feature the control blade multi-link rear damping system. What a pity that Ford can't standardise this more advanced package, as Korean rivals do, as the first generation version of this model did. Even in its most basic form though, this Focus remains an entertainer at heart. A car you'll feel at one with thanks to its progressive body control and steering precision. As a result, it's still 
a default pick amongst family hatchbacks if you like your driving. But not everyone does. Many family hatchback folk are buying a car of this kind simply because it ticks the right boxes for safety, practicality and running costs. And I have a suspicion that it's these people who will have their perceptions most changed by this much improved Mark IV model. They may, like us, wonder why it couldn't have been just a touch more visually interesting and wish for a slightly more classy cabin. But they'll certainly like the responsively frugal new generation engines, the higher safety standards, the improved quality and the fact that at long last there's decent rear passenger and luggage space. In short, if you can afford the asking prices, you'll find that here's a family hatchback that now has its priorities right. A car that's grown up, but one that still knows how to enjoy itself. I wonder just how many owners will ever discover that. Perhaps it doesn't matter. This car, after all, no longer depends solely on handling supremacy to justify its position at the top of the sales charts. Smarter and more sensible, it is, more than ever, number one for a reason.